Hi, I'm Craig. And I'm Linda. And this is the Indie Travel Podcast at IndieTravelPodcast.com. This is episode 359, and we're talking about our top five things to do in London. That's right. It is a fantastic city, just a couple of hours away from where we are right now, which is in Stroud in the Cotswolds. We've been here for what, about six, seven weeks now, and it's been absolutely lovely. We've been house-sitting. We've got a pet dog and a pet cat and some fish. And the fish have been a bit disdainful. They haven't spent a lot of time with us. But um, the cat and the dog have been interestingly affectionate. The cat in particular is quite, I don't know, interactive, but not necessarily in a great way. He likes to kind of scratch our heads if we don't feed him fast enough. (laughs) Now we can never feed him fast enough. But it has been good. And I actually spent the last weekend down in Brighton. It is nice to be beside the seaside. I was down there for a WordPress conference and met up with a whole lot of industry people down there. Yeah, I was a bit jealous, but I got to stay behind and look after the dog. And I went to an outdoor theater performance and a cider and sausage festival, which is kind of fun. Yeah, you can't complain about that. Well, let us talk about that big city over to the east, London. That's right. We have spent a lot of time in London. It's quite often our jumping in or jumping out point for getting to Europe because, well, there are like five airports, so it's really convenient for flights. And also there are lots of different ways of getting from and to London from Europe as well. So we often use it as a a staging post. Yeah, we've often had a a love-hate relationship with it, but normally not at the same time. It's a city that in various times we've gone, ah, do we have to go back to London And then at other times we're going, we're going to London. Yeah. And it's been a really, uh, you know, a a split personality kind of relationship. I think London is just so enormous, right? It's got so much going on that you can have a different relationship with it every day of the year. And we've spent time in lots of different parts of the city as well. We've spent time with friends. We've spent time with family. We've been by ourselves. And we've gotten to know lots of different areas. So I think we say these are our top things to do in London, but... Really, you can have so many hundreds of thousands of experiences in London. It's just so amazing. And so hopefully if you've never been to the city, this show will give you an idea about what might capture your attention. But it is an old city and it is a vibrant city. So it's hard to pin it down in just a 15 to 20 minute episode. Yeah. These are our top five things to do. And I mean, five things to do in London, it's impossible to encompass any kind of full experience, but yeah, we'll just give you some ideas. We'll talk about some of our favorite experiences and yeah, I'm sure you'll have an awesome time. One of the things that entrances me about London is all of the things that have happened in it and to it. So number one, get some history, get a feeling of where the city has come from and what the people in the city have done. Yeah, I think this is a really important one for us coming from New Zealand, which is one of the youngest countries in the world. I mean, people only arrived in New Zealand about a thousand years ago. So before that, it was just birds. So we come to London and we think, wow, I mean, there was a Roman city here, Londinium, but people have lived in London since prehistory, since before records began, since before we can even imagine. So for us, this depth of history is just so amazing because we don't have that in our country. We don't have those thousands and thousands of years of human habitation to look at. But whatever period of the past calls your attention, there'll be something for you. If you're interested in prehistory, you'll be able to find information. If you're interested in in the wars, you'll be able to find information. There's hundreds of museums that you can go to. Most of them are free. Uh, the British Museum and the V&A are two very good ones. It's the Victoria and Albert Museum, just in case you're wondering. The first time I saw that, I was like, what does that even mean, V&A, for Victoria and Albert? And we once went to the War Museum, which I, I'm not really a big fan of war museums, but I found it quite interesting. And what I particularly found interesting was that just outside there was a peace garden, which I thought was quite a nice idea. Yeah, and the Florence Nightingale Museum nearby as well. Yeah, that was quite interesting as well. Thinking of people, Charles Dickens, famous author, and we did a walking tour around his work and the settings of many of his books, which was put on by Context Travel, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think that was particularly interesting because it dealt with a certain period of history, one that's been quite well documented and is quite present in kind of social consciousness. Now, we all think about Victorian times and working in the factories and stuff like that. So to go there and see some of the actual buildings and see where 
Johnson wrote his dictionary and all of these cool things, I don't know, it gave me a real connection with the past. If you don't want to do a tour or go to a museum, you'll definitely want to just wander around. And so where would you wander? I reckon uh, along the South Bank where there are several art and design museums. And then you come to Tower of London. And when we first came to London, Tower of London was the number one thing we wanted to see. Old Castle, on the river, ghost stories, political intrigue, all sorts of cool stuff. And I would still say that's a top attraction. Yeah, and if you're looking for history, that's definitely a place to go because it's one of these buildings that's grown over time. And you can see models of, you know, the first building, the next buildings that were added. It's really, really cool. If I could add another one on there, I would put in Greenwich for history. You know, we talk about GMT, Greenwich Mean Time, and this is the place where time begins. Not quite. Not quite. But yeah. But yeah. Like. <laughs> yes, but no. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This. This is the. This is the place. Yeah, it's really cool, and there's a like a, a laser theme that's exactly where the line of time is, which is kind of cool. Yeah, you're grinning like a geek, and so am I. Yeah, so much fun. There was, was, there was also a little museum with uh, time implements and various gadgets that were used to. Uh, well, it's so important because with being able to accurately tell time, you could then accurately plot where you were on a sea voyage. Mm-hmm. And so this technological advantage gave Britain this this huge advantage in the colonial times and uh, as they kind of kicked off the era of exploration. As soon as you could tell time accurately, you could tell where you were accurately. And it was pretty amazing. Hey, let's move on from all of that geekery (laughs) and chill out a bit. Let's do number two, which is to go and see a show. Yeah, I think this is a really good one to do in London because London has an amazing theatre community and the place to go is the West End. So it's a a collection of streets. There's dozens or hundreds of different theatres around the place. So just pick a show that you're interested in and head along. Yeah, you probably, if you don't really know where you're going, you just want to, you know, poke your head out and go for a walk around, you'll want to jump off the tube at Leicester Square, Piccadilly Circus, Covent Garden. Any of those tube stations will put you in the right area. Yeah. Now, when you're choosing a show, runs seem to last forever, like years and years and years. So if there's a particular show you want to see and it's on at the moment and you're not sure if it's going to be on when you get to London, it probably will be. Well, the extreme example of that is The Mousetrap by Agatha Christie. It's been running for over 60 years now. Yeah, that's. I really want to see. I can't believe how many times we've been to London and it's always been on my list. Go and see The Mousetrap, go and see The Mousetrap. And we still haven't been. So maybe next time we could go and see The Mousetrap. Maybe, maybe we could. Uh, over the last few years, we have gone to see a couple of shows. We went to see Annie. Yeah, that was quite fun. I went to see The Lion King. That was my favorite. And uh, you went to see Kinky Boots. Yeah, yeah, it was a really fun experience. One thing I found interesting about theater in London, which we we don't have in New Zealand because we have not such an enormous population to support the, the weight of people going to the theater, is that shows will take over an entire theater. So it's not like for us, when you, you go to one theater, you might see a bunch of different plays there over the years. In this case, shows tend to take over the whole place and they'll like change the, the color of the walls, for example. When we went to see The Lion King, our guy was explaining to us how they, they painted the walls to fit the set. And if The Lion King ever stops showing there, they've got a contract, they've got to paint them back the original color. So I thought that was quite interesting. Absolutely. And if you are there, there are a lot of kind of meal deals that go on before and after shows. So especially if you're eating before seven, that kind of five to seven, what would normally be happy hour Mm -hmm. is like pre-show dining special time. Yeah. So have a look out, keep an eye out for one of those and you can probably save a bit of money. Thinking of eating, number three is eating. That's right. Yeah. And forget all of the bad things you've heard about British food. Because they're all true, but you don't have to suffer through them. Yeah. I mean, London is so cosmopolitan. There's food from all around the world. You can get any food you want if you want it. But there are some things that we'd really recommend you try. For example, head to Brick Lane for um, Indian food. There are just dozens and dozens of Indian restaurants, and they're, well, they're pretty much all good. Something that I've always enjoyed has been been not the newcomers to the British food scene, but the old timers. You have roast meat and mm. roast veg. 
sitting in the pub with a locally produced beer, and uh, yeah, a couple of pints of beer and a big slow roasted lamb leg or roast beef with horseradish. It's it's what to do on a rainy Sunday afternoon. Definitely. One thing to be aware of, we'd strongly recommend you go to the pub and have a, a Sunday roast lunch, but a lot of the pubs in London and England in general are chains. So there might be Weatherspoon, there might be Young's, there's, there's a whole bunch of different chains. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you might see what looks like a traditional pub that is not really traditional. You go in and you see that it's got a, uh, a flash-printed menu and everything. And sometimes these can be good things because... They sometimes have, for example, Tuesday burger deal, and it's, it's really good value. But yeah, just something to be aware of. Yeah, the food in those tends to be consistently average. So mm-hmm. it's, it's normally safe, but it's never wonderful. Yeah, that's definitely what we found. We found it really weird. We often found ourselves in Victoria Station waiting for a bus or a train, and there was a Weatherspoons pub there. We'd go in there, and they had the same deal as all of the other Weatherspoon pubs, but they weren't allowed to serve hot chips. So we got like, nacho chips instead and i always found that really weird yeah yeah burger and nachos yeah (laughs) if you're looking to save money while you're in london because it isn't a cheap city places like sainsbury's and boots and wh smith's and that's right a, a supermarket a pharmacy and a stationery store Each of these will have meal deals. They'll have prepackaged sandwiches that come with drinks and fruit or chips. And you can pick it up normally pretty cheaply, anywhere between kind of two to five pounds, depending on what the combination of foods are that you pick up. Tends to be around 350. Yeah, yeah. It's somewhere in that range. It's a very cheap way to get filling lunch or uh, afternoon snack or early dinner. I particularly like it because quite often like innocent smoothies are included in the meal deal and they'll be two pounds by themselves. So it works out to be really good value. Yeah, it's a good thing to get, especially if you're like running through a station or need to get food on a go or just need fuel between sightseeing. Yeah, it can be a really fast and cheap way to get a feed. But if you want to go out the other side and spend some money to have a special experience, London is an amazing place to do that. A lot of the upmarket hotels will have afternoon tea deals and yeah, fancy, fancy afternoon tea deals. Yeah, I definitely want to try that sometime. We haven't managed it ourselves, but it's something that we'd like to try. And then, of course, there are lots of famous upmarket restaurants that you might want to consider. One we went to a couple of years ago was Dan Le Noir, which is a dining in the dark experience, and it was absolutely epic. You arrive, you have to take off anything that shows any light, any watches or anything like that. You have to put your phone in a locker, and then you have this experience. You're dining in complete blackness. So it was just amazing. Yeah, it was good fun, especially getting a long tentacle of octopus. <laughs> and you're, you're prodding it, going, what is, ugh, what is that? Yeah, because you uh, you order kind of a menu. You get to choose either the, the vegetarian meal or the red meat or seafood or mixed or whatever, but you don't know what you're going to eat. And so the food comes out and you're kind of trying to work it out. So really fun. (laughs) So good. So good. Hey, let's move on and talk about being on the water in an inland city. Well, London is built around the Thames, right? The River Thames. So although it's not a seaside city, water does play a very important part in its life. So I'd say head to the Thames, spend some time around the water. Craig spoke earlier about walking along the South Bank. That's the South Bank of the River Thames, in case you were wondering. There's all these bridges. You'll have seen photos of Tower Bridge, and there's the Westminster Bridge, which is a really good place to take photos of the Houses of Parliament. There's the Millennium Bridge, which is a nice pedestrian walkway. Heaps of really cool bridges to walk across and just be by the river. Yeah, and South Bank has its own great collection of galleries, and it's where Shakespeare's Globe is situated as well, if you want to go to a show that's not in the West End. If you do want to do that, book tickets early. I tried booking tickets for this year about three months in advance, and we could only get two different single seats available on two different levels of the uh of the gallery. So that was pretty crazy. Yeah. But yeah, South Bank is great. If you're there in September, that's when the Thames Festival is on. So if you're planning a trip in the near future, since we're recording in August, it would be a great time to get along to the Thames. Boat races, music, even more buskers and festival kind of vibe than there normally is over the summer. Another thing you could do is hop on a short boat trip. Uh, Some of the hop on, hop off 
tourist buses actually include a boat trip on the river as part of the, the cost of the package. My mum was over here recently and we were looking at hop-on, hop-off bus tickets for her and it looked like a really good deal. I think London would be quite a good city to do a hop-on, hop-off bus tour just to get an idea of what's around because it's so dense, you know, especially because you're traveling by tube most of the time, you're underground, you don't really know where anything is. So yeah, it could be worth considering. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. And uh, some of those boat trips, you can use your Oyster or public transport card to tag on, tag off and do the trip that way. So yeah, it's it's a very active river. It's not just for tourists, it's used by commuters as well. Uh, there are other ways if you just want to get an idea of what the river looks like, you can go up the London Eye. We found it a bit overpriced, but if you're into Ferris wheels, then it might be worth considering. Great view of the river, great view of the city. Cool. Well, let's wrap up by talking about some of the parks and gardens, because to me, that's what makes London so, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say unique, because a lot of great cities have great parks and gardens, but they really seem to be part of the, the lifeblood of London. And they're also such a lovely, refreshing place to get away from the noise of cars and the busyness of everything going on. Yeah, we often spend a lot of time in parks. Like when we're visiting my brother, we'll go and get some lunch and have lunch in the park, just uh, watching people walk by. It's really nice. When we're in the center of London, we always visit Hyde Park, which is famous for Speaker's Corner, which is a traditional place where people can stand up and exercise their right to free speech. And people who are listening can exercise their right to free heckling. And uh, yeah, so that's quite fun. I remember the first time we came to London and we were wandering around and one of us, I can't remember which one of us it was, saw a squirrel. And we said to everyone, oh my goodness, look. And we were like staring at the squirrel because we'd never seen a squirrel before because we don't have them in New Zealand. And we were staring at it, staring at it. And then kind of our view widened and we saw dozens and dozens of squirrels all over the place. We realized that it wasn't quite as exciting as we thought it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was after we had stalked this one squirrel for two or three minutes, like, wait, there's a nut. Oh, look, there's dozens of them. Yeah. <laughs> dozens and dozens. <laughs> It's quite funny when we go for a walk with the dog here in Stroud, he loves seeing squirrels and the squirrels seem to kind of taunt him. One of them came halfway down a tree just to kind of look at him and then went around the back to, to taunt him. It was the funniest thing looking at this tree with a squirrel hanging down at about waist height on one side of the trunk and the dog standing on the other side of the trunk like wondering where it went. Yeah, where's the squirrel? the funniest thing I've seen in such a long time. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of parks right throughout London. Uh, we won't list them all, but do go and explore. If you're lucky, you'll come across uh, a fair, a pop-up event, a mini festival. Uh, there's so much that goes on. So good. Running into accidental beer festivals has to be one of the best things ever to happen in life. Uh, but I do want to point out Kew Gardens. It's not in central London. You won't accidentally come across it, but you can jump on a train, go out to Kew Gardens. They are fantastic. Yeah, lots of really interesting plants out there if you're interested in botany. Yeah, yeah, they have a, a huge collection and a massive seed bank uh, to help preserve some of the plants that we have now that might not exist in a few years. Okay, so those are our top five things to do in London. I know that we haven't covered everything. It's impossible to cover everything in five points. There is so much more to do in London. There's heaps of markets, there's festivals all the time, there's events, there's so many great tourist attractions to go to. We, we can't even begin to start talking about them all, but we have mentioned our top five things to do and would be interested to know which of these things you're most interested to do, which things you think we've missed. So visit IndieTravelPodcast.com, find the show notes and leave a comment. Hey, a few practicalities before we wrap up for when you're planning your trip to London. I mentioned before the Oyster card, which is like a public transport card that you preload with credit and you can use it to tap on and tap off everything. There's an integrated system, so buses and tubes and some of the inner city trains, not the ones that go out of the city. So just be careful of that. But from a few years ago, you can actually use your credit card or debit card if it's got a contactless chip. And you can just tag on and tag off with that. It's the same price as an Oyster card. So whereas in the past, it was best if you like ordered an Oyster card in advance and you got it sent to you so you could use it straight away. Now you don't need to worry about it. Use any contactless card you've got and tag on and tag off. Yeah, just make sure to keep an eye on your credit card statement to make sure you haven't been overcharged. 
I'd say you do definitely want to use public transport. I guess I jumped the gun a little bit there because not only is London city traffic city traffic, there's also extra charges for driving around in the central city. So if you hire a car, you should be aware of the congestion charges and things like that. So I wouldn't recommend driving around the city itself. Use public transport. Uh, use taxis or Uber if you're just doing uh, if you're doing kind of unusual jumps. And yeah, if you're renting a car, it's best to be driving out of London. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely hire a car if you're going for a day trip, something like that. But yeah, use it to get away from the city rather than get around the city. We find the City Mapper app really useful for finding our way around London. Last time we were there, we needed to get from my brother's house into the city to get a train out to here to Stroud. And the City Map app was quite helpful. It told us that there was a delay on a certain train. And so we looked into other options. By the time it was time to leave, the delay was, was over, but it was really good to know. Now, we mentioned before there are several airports around London, and that can be confusing when you are flying in or flying out. So be sure to look at what airport you're actually flying into, because some of them have connections by tube, some of them only by train, some of them really only well served by coaches and taxis. So knowing which airport you're going into or going out of will have a big impact on your plans getting to and from the airport. Yeah, and if you're looking at flights and trying to choose which airport to arrive in, Heathrow is probably the most convenient because it's right on the tube line. I'd say Gatwick would be number two, or City maybe, but very few flights go into London City. Stansted and Luton tend to be less convenient. Less convenient, yes. Far, far from it. Yeah, but you can quite often get very, very, very cheap flights out of Stansted and Luton. So sometimes it's worth your while, but just make sure to factor in the cost of transport and also the time of the transport into and out of the airport. We're always trying to get in and out of Heathrow these days because my brother lives on the Piccadilly line, which is the tube line that goes to and from Heathrow Airport. So yeah, very convenient, but very inconvenient for all of the other airports. <laughs> But let's wrap up what's happening over the next few weeks. We're still in Stroud, but for only one more week, uh, we are packing up and moving on. Yeah, Craig's going to be doing the Cotswold Way walk with our friend Dave, who has a travel blog, What's Dave Doing? And I'm going to be staying in Stroud all by myself, but then I'll be joining them for the weekend, which will be nice. Yeah, after that hike finishes up, we'll be heading over to Birmingham flying out to Belfast, and then jumping down to Bristol. It's so. been very difficult booking flights recently <laughs> <laughs> because Craig went to Brighton as well, so we had four B cities. But we're thinking maybe later in the year we might go up a letter of the alphabet, head to Cyprus. Yeah, yeah. B, 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 C. Yeah. <laughs> we have to sing it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should start practicing because I'm really mm. bad. <laughs> All right. Well, that's us for this week. Until next time, travel well.